Please be advised, this episode does have content that some may find distressing. As always, listener discretion is advised and it is not suitable for anyone under the age of 13. Hello and welcome to episode 37 of It's Murder Up North. As always, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who continues to listen and support the show. I've had some lovely feedback regarding recent episodes, and it means a lot to read such kind words. I try my best to ensure that each episode is detailed, but above all shows compassion, and highlights the life of the person at the heart of the story, because before they were victims, they were an individual with hopes and dreams. Now to my podcast of the week. If you enjoy spooky stuff, please check out Archie and Kerry and their show, History of a Haunting. Here is a sneak peek. Hi guys, we are your hosts of History of a Haunting podcast. My name is Kerry Hopper. And I am Archie Bayes, and we are a weekly historical and paranormal podcast that brings you the history and the hauntings of locations all over the world, with barrels of facts, casks of humor, and boxes of wine. We take bad notes, can't do math, and words are hard. So grab a glass of wine and settle in. We've got some famous, infamous, and almost famous locations to tell you about and why they became terrifying places to visit. You can find us anywhere you find your favorite podcasts and all over social media at HOAH Podcast and HOAHpodcast.com. Stay safe out there because you never know who or what is listening. Now, let's head to the episode. Be good and stay out of trouble, Kevin Rossington stated, smiling at his 21-year-old son as he headed to bed at 11pm. As Kevin walked up the stairs, there was a twinge of sadness. Sean was their youngest child and soon he would be leaving home to live with his girlfriend. Now alone in the living room of his parents' house, Sean sat with his computer, checking the latest updates on social media and conversing with his friends when he was interrupted by his phone announcing the arrival of a text. Once he had finished reading the message, he proceeded to switch off his computer, extinguished the living room lights, and went to put his coat on. He paused for a moment at the foot of the stairs, listening for his parents, but they were silent. So quietly, Sean slipped out the front door, closing it softly to avoid waking his mum and dad. He stepped out into the noiseless night. The glow of the lights in the city of Lincoln lit up the grey clouds. As Sean made his way along the deserted streets, with just the whispering wind for company, shadows stretched before him. Discarded tin cans rattled on the road as they were swept along by the breeze. Sean nervously checked over his shoulder, alert to every unfamiliar sound that made the twenty-one-year-old shudder. Sean wasn't used to being out in the dark, and the streets seemed unrecognisable to him. He paused for a moment, uncertain of which way to go. Alone and vulnerable, Sean replied to the text that had caused him to leave home, advising that he was lost. Quickly he received a reply, and once again the six-foot-four man set off, walking along the residential streets. He reached the edge of the housing estate. Before him waited a path that crossed a field and led to the intersection of Nettleham Road and Searby Road. The field was cast in shadow, with a perimeter of street lights which lined the roads. As he made his way towards the main road, he became aware of a figure ahead of him, but he wasn't afraid as he approached the person. He smiled and greeted them. The following morning the alarm blared, jolting Sharon Rossington awake. It was 5am and the daylight had begun to penetrate through the gaps in the curtain. Her eyes still heavy with sleep, she reluctantly clambered out of bed and made her way to prepare for work. Having gotten dressed, eaten her breakfast and had a refreshing cup of tea, she headed upstairs to wake Sean. Opening the door, she discovered the curtains were open and the bed was made. Sharon didn't think anything of her son's absence. Sometimes he would visit a neighbour to play computer games or would stay over at his house. 
Besides, Sean was scared of the dark, so he wouldn't have ventured far. At 6.30, Sharon had to leave for work, and as she kissed Kevin goodbye, she asked her husband to let her know when Sean got home. Upon arriving at the small convenience store where she worked, Sharon checked her phone, but she'd received no messages or calls. Still unperturbed, she placed her phone in the back office and opened the shop for the day. As she stocked the shelves and unpacked the newspapers, she paused to read the front pages. It was the 3rd of June, 2010, and the news headlines that day were focused on one thing, the horrific spree killing in Whitehaven, Cumbria, in which 12 people had been killed by a gunman, Derek Bird. Throughout the morning, as she tried to carry out her duties, Sharon was preoccupied. She began to have an uneasy feeling that just wouldn't go away. She kept thinking about the fact Sean hadn't been in his bed, and wondered if she'd missed him telling her that he would be going out. At 1pm, Sharon still hadn't heard anything from Sean, and her stomach was now knotted with worry. It wasn't like Sean not to message her. As the mother waited anxiously for her shift to end, a lady entered the shop. Her dark brown hair swept neatly back in a bun. The woman introduced herself as a Diane Squires, a family liaison officer from Lincolnshire Police. She asked Sharon if there was somewhere private they could talk. Shaking Sharon led the officer to the room at the rear of the shop, trying to maintain her composure, knowing that she was about to hear every mother's worst nightmare. The officer proceeded to explain that at approximately 4am, the body had been found on a patch of grassland, approximately half an hour's walk away from the family's home. Now currently, Sean's death was being investigated as unexplained, but initial thoughts were that he had been struck by a car. Sharon couldn't comprehend what she was being told. The warmth of Diane's words just did not sink in, and for a moment she stared vacantly at the officer, her inner voice protesting that her son couldn't be dead. He was a happy, healthy 21-year-old with his whole life ahead of him. Lost in an abyss of disbelief, her thoughts shifted to the last time she saw Sean, his smiling face as he sat on the sofa. One of Sean's passions was to exercise, and she recalled that Sean had gone to the gym with his friend from a couple of doors away, the same friend she presumed Sean had gone to stay with when she found his bed empty that morning. The evening before, when he returned home from the gym, he was smiling and in good spirits as he joined his parents in front of the television. Sharon remembered heading off to bed wishing her son a good night as he sat on the sofa in the living room, dressed in his hooded sweatshirt and navy blue tracksuit buttons, with his computer on his lap. It didn't make sense. Why had her 21-year-old son, who was scared of the dark, left their home in the middle of the night? And how had he ended up dead on a patch of grass nearly two miles away from their home? An emergency call had been received at seven minutes past four that morning from four teenagers who had stumbled across the body as they made their way across the unlit field. Police were informed of the deceased man's presence and upon arrival they found Sean lying face down on a stretch of grassland that sat at the corner of Searby Road and Nettleham Road in Lincoln, both of which are busy for affairs. Crossing the field on foot, you would reach the housing estate beyond, making it a popular shortcut for pedestrians. As commuters walk in the city of Lincoln, the news of the discovery trickled through the residents in the area. Police initially described the man's death as unexplained, However, they were leaning towards the possibility that Sean had been struck by a car due to the severity of his injuries. Investigators believed that the collision caused the 21-year-old to lose his shoes, which were found lying in the road. Barefoot and seriously wounded, he had managed to stagger to the field, where he collapsed and was later discovered by the teenagers. Officers secured the scene and set about trying to identify the man. A search of his pockets revealed that the victim had no keys, no wallet or phone. The only item he had on his person was a membership fob for a nearby gym. The lack of any personal possessions added another possibility. Had Sean been the victim of a robbery that had gone wrong? With the only clues to the man's identity being the gym membership, an officer was dispatched to the gym as soon as it opened that morning. When the member of staff scanned the fob, 
it brought up the details of 21-year-old Sean Rossington, who was a fitness fanatic and football player. A regular at the gym, staff at the facility stated that Sean was a quiet but sweet guy. Now with a name, it was a task of Diane Squires to deliver the news to the young man's family. Until the results of the post-mortem were made available, Sean's cause of death was uncertain, but officers continued with their investigation, questioning the young man's family about Sean and his lifestyle. Sean Rossington was born in 1988 in Lincoln. He was described as a happy and excitable child, who was fascinated by cars, football and bike riding. His toy cars would often be found scattered about the house as they drove about on imagined adventures. He also loved to be outside on his bike, and would ride it for hours around the street where his family lived. When he was free, Sean became unwell. At first he complained his body hurt, and the little boy who loved his food lost his appetite. His parents became concerned when his temperature soared dangerously, and as his mum, Sharon, attempted to cool him down, the toddler's limbs stiffened, his body began to shake uncontrollably, and foam started to seep from his mouth. Terrified, his parents took him to the hospital, where he was diagnosed with chickenpox. Following his recovery from the illness, Sharon and Kevin noticed a change in their son as his development progressed. Although he seemed physically healthy, he was clumsy, and although he was bright and spoke well, he seemed to find it difficult to have conversations with others, meaning he struggled to make friends. His inability to interact with others frustrated Sean, as he found it harder to integrate with children his own age. As his peers started to show understanding of the complexities of human interaction and emotions, Sean did not seem to grasp the concepts of humour or sarcasm. He was unable to recognise when people were lying, nor did he seem to show a display of empathy. His parents also observed that he would have a distant look, or would avoid making eye contact, and Sean demonstrated an overly trusting nature. Naturally, Sharon and Kevin were concerned for their son, and they took Sean to be assessed by a specialist, who after performing a series of observations and tracking his development, noted that Sean was showing signs of Asperger's disorder, a condition described by the Autism Society as, quote, the symptoms for Asperger's disorder were the same as those listed for autism. However, children with Asperger's do not have delays in the area of communication and language. In fact, to be diagnosed with Asperger's, a child must have normal language development, as well as normal intelligence. The criteria for Asperger's specified that the individual must have severe and sustained impairment in social interaction and the development of restricted, repetitive patterns of behaviour, interests and activities that must cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. Early diagnosis is also important as children with Asperger's disorder who are diagnosed and treated early in life have an increased chance of being successful in school and eventually living independently, end quote. Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital advised, quote, Autism affects every child in a different manner. Many children with autism may develop a range of coping strategies and grow up to lead relatively independent lives. Others may need long-term support to help them lead fulfilling lives. When children are younger, it can be difficult to predict how their particular difficulties will develop as they get older. There can also be specific times in their life when their difficulties may be more apparent, for example, during puberty or transitions to secondary school or adulthood. It is helpful to be aware that young people with autism are at risk of developing other difficulties, such as anxiety, depression or behavioural problems. These conditions are not part of autism and are often treatable. While it is beneficial to help children with the areas of difficulty, it is equally as important to support children in the areas of their strengths. It is often the child's strengths that increase their quality of life, help them to achieve their potential and contribute to society. Sharon and Kevin realised that Sean had a great love of sports, so they encouraged this in him. This was one of his strengths. It is important for me to point out that although Sean's family believed that the fit he suffered may have caused him to have learning difficulties, there has been no conclusive link between chickenpox causing autism. Furthermore, chickenpox can affect each child differently, 
Some may have mild symptoms, while others will be like Sean. They'll have a raised temperature and may suffer from fits. In most cases, these seizures are scary, yet harmless. There are still many uncertainties regarding the cause of autism. However, there is a general belief that it is genetic, and those who are diagnosed are born with it. Although Sean struggled with social interactions, he had two main loves in his life, football and cars. He played for the Lincoln City Sharks football team and was an avid supporter of his home team, Lincoln City, as well as a big fan of Manchester United. Prior to his death, Sean was getting excited about the FIFA World Cup that was due to start on the 11th of June in South Africa. He was planning on watching every game and he was also planning on taking his first steps into adulthood, with the intention of moving in with his girlfriend. By the time Sean had reached the age of 14, he was described as tall for his age, and at 21, Sean was a towering six foot four, described by his family and friends as a gentle giant. His height and physical fitness concealed how vulnerable he was. Like many with Asperger's, Sean took what people said at face value. Unable to comprehend, sarcasm or lies. At 17 years old, he was recognised as a vulnerable individual due to him being naive and overly trusting. Sadly, this means that like many in Sean's situation, he was more susceptible to manipulation and coercion. People are willing to abuse their trusting nature under the guise of friendship, and sadly for Sean, this cost him his life. Devastated by their son's death, Sean's parents paid tribute to him, quote, he only had friends, no enemies. His passion was football cars in the gym. He loved watching Lincoln City play and would never miss a home game. He was so looking forward to watching all the World Cup matches on the television. Sean was also a keen player and in season turned out regularly for Lincoln City Sharks. He went to his gym regularly and was very fit and healthy. In reference to Sean being out that night, they continued that this was totally out of character. He just never stayed out all night. He was his usual happy self watching television when we went to bed, and he must have decided to go out later. It is just so difficult to understand what has happened. We have lost a dearly loved son and brother to our other son, 24-year-old Chris. We are all shattered by this, and want to be left alone to grieve and try to start to come to terms with our loss. End quote. Just an hour after Sean had been found deceased by the teenagers, the police had gone to question them as witnesses. They arrived at a block of flats known as Edinburgh House, which sat approximately ten minutes' walk away from the field where Sean had been found. Within the flat they encountered four youths, the youngest of whom was just thirteen years old. They were accompanied by a seventeen-year-old male, and shortly after the police had arrived, they were joined by two more individuals, including twenty-six-year-old Nicholas Shelbourne, who was the registered tenant. He casually advised the officers that he had just been to the form box to make a call. As police had few clues regarding what happened to Sean, the teenagers were invited back to the station, where their clothing could be processed for evidence and their statements taken. The decision was made for all seven occupants of the flat to be brought in, to ensure vital information wasn't lost. Upon arrival at the station, they were each questioned individually. They told police a consistent story. They had all arrived at Nicholas's flat just after 8pm on that night, and were there chatting until 11pm. They proceeded to advise investigators that because none of them had credit on their phones, the group had gone to a nearby phone box to order pizza, only to find the phone box was out of service, so they returned back to the flat. At 4am, the 16-year-old girl remembered she needed to collect some clothes from a friend's house and so the 13-year-old girl decided to accompany her, along with the 20-year-old Mark Jackson and 16-year-old Jordan O'Rourke. The quartet walked in the direction of Searby Road, with the intention of walking across the grass as a shortcut. Jordan claimed that as they crossed the field, they noticed the man lying motionless on the grass. Mark Jackson advised that he had knelt beside Sean and attempted to rouse him, but when he lifted the man's head, he noticed Sean was bleeding and he had several visible bruises. Upon checking, Mark discovered that the injured man wasn't breathing, and his body was cold to the touch. The 16-year-old girl called 999, and she and her friends lingered, waiting for the ambulance to arrive. 
Once they had provided their details to the police officers at the scene, the four of them headed back to the flat, where their discovery was met with shock and disbelief. Having provided investigators with their statements, and handed their claws over to be processed for evidence, the seven friends were allowed to return home, while the investigation continued. In order to generate clues that could help determine what had occurred, door-to-door inquiries were conducted, with the aim of collecting statements and possible CCTV footage. One witness, a man in his forties who didn't live far from the crime scene, told police that he had been crossing the field at about 2am when he came across a man lying in the grass. He presumed the person was asleep, so tried to wake Sean, and when he failed to wake up, the man assumed that he was probably under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So after one last attempt to rouse Sean, the man continued on his way to his friend's house, leaving the 21-year-old lying unconscious on the ground. The 40-year-old then explained that upon returning from his friends half an hour later, Sean was still lying on the grass. He was breathing but unresponsive, so the man headed home. Just an hour and a half later, Sean Rossington had passed away. I cannot imagine the guilt this individual felt when he learnt that the man he passed twice had died. Having been informed of their son's death, Sharon and Kevin were asked to formally identify Sean's body. His mum recalled seeing him, stating, quote, He just didn't look like the Sean we remember. Just awful. I don't think I will ever forget what I saw. Sean's remains were taken to Lincoln County Hospital, where Home Office pathologist Guy Rutty carried out the autopsy. He recorded that the deceased had injuries consistent with being beaten by means of punches and kicks. There were also signs that he had been violently stamped on. Sean had suffered 41 injuries to his body, primarily about his head and chest. He had also been stabbed in the back twice and had sustained a head injury, consistent with being struck with a blunt object. However, despite these numerous injuries, the pathologist concluded that Sean had actually died from asphyxiation, caused by him being laid face down and unconscious in a position which prevented him breathing. Lincoln Police announced that they were now treating Sean's death as a murder inquiry, and a week after the 21-year-old had died, they issued an appeal for witnesses, quote, Sean's body was found a week ago today, and I want people to think what they were doing at this time last week, and if they had been in the area or saw anything they think might be suspicious to contact us in confidence, and let us be the judge of whether the information is useful or not. Also, Anyone who knows Sean and can offer any information which may assist is asked to contact police in confidence. The one key question the police had was what had caused this 21-year-old man with learning difficulties who was afraid of the dark to head half a mile away from his home in the middle of the night. Having spoken to his family, this behaviour was out of character for Sean and investigators considered the possibility that he left the house to meet someone he knew. Knowing that he'd been on his laptop at the time his parents had gone to bed, police were eager to see who he'd been interacting with. But this was going to take time. So they hoped Sean's mobile phone would yield some information. However, despite extensive searches, his phone could not be located. Investigators, therefore, had to resort to requesting Sean's phone records. While waiting for the phone company to provide the data, police continued to investigate. They acquired surveillance footage along the route that Sean was likely to have taken, and continued conducting door-to-door inquiries. There were a number of witnesses who lived in the streets near the field, who recalled hearing raised male voices at approximately 2am. And one man witnessed a group heading away from the crime scene, but this witness was unable to provide an accurate description due to the lack of light. Given the brutality of the attack and the fear that was spreading in the area, as residents grew increasingly nervous that there was a killer amongst them, the police urgently needed a break in the case. And this was to come in the form of Sean's phone records, which revealed the shocking truth. The data received showed that Sean had been using his phone between 5 past 1 that morning, up until 10 to 2. These communications consisted of multiple texts and calls. The final call was three minutes long and occurred roughly ten minutes before investigators believed Sean had been attacked. All these messages and phone calls were made to the same person, and what shocked officers more was the fact that this number had already been seen during the investigation. 
It was the same number which the 16-year-old girl had called 999 from when she claimed to have found Sean's body. Believing that the teenage girl knew more about the incident, she was arrested along with the seven other individuals who had been in Shelbourne's flats on the night of the murder. Due to their ages, some of those arrested were not named for legal reasons. However, this is the limited information I could find. Starting with the flat's registered tenant, Nicholas Shelbourne, who lived in a one-bedroom flat at number 12 Edinburgh House in Lincoln. He was unemployed and living on benefits. It was noted that the 26-year-old had issues with socialising with his peer group, and due to his immature nature, he preferred the company of those younger than himself. Like Shelbourne, 20-year-old Mark Jackson also seemed immature. His parents had separated and there was tensions within his family dynamic. 17-year-old Jordan O'Rourke was a quiet, softly spoken teenager who was intelligent and came from a good home. He had no prior convictions. Of the seven who were arrested, 16-year-old Daryl Jones had the most concerning background. His parents had divorced when he was a child and he'd begun to get into trouble at school, resulting in him being expelled. Jones was also known to the police, having had prior convictions for violent offences. The other 16-year-old has had his identity protected. However, police described him as a quiet and lonely individual who had been sleeping at numerous addresses, including Shelbourne's. The 16-year-old girl who had formed an ambulance for Sean had a confident and sunny disposition with dreams of becoming a nursery school teacher. It was her phone call, however, that had turned the seven from just being potential witnesses to suspects. The other teenage girl was the youngest member of the group at just 13 years old, and many questions were asked regarding why she was out at that time of night, and what she was doing in a group that included a 26-year-old man. The full details of her circumstances have not been disclosed for legal reasons, except for the fact that social services were involved. During the police interviews, the majority of the group maintained the original stories they had told to police, except for Daryl Jones and Jordan O'Rourke, who presented no comment answers. As the interviews continued, however, the 16-year-old boy and the 13-year-old girl broke ranks and decided to tell police what had actually occurred that night. The 16-year-old boy claimed that Nick had told them to lie to the police to protect the whole group. He proceeded to state that they went out with the intention of meeting someone and that plan was to assault the individual whom they had arranged for the 13-year-old girl to meet. They arrived at the field where the 16-year-old claimed that the girl met Sean and while she talked to the 21-year-old, the rest of the group emerged from the darkness and before Sean was aware of their presence, Jordan O'Rourke struck the six-foot-four gentle giant over the head with a glass bottle. Sean was then set upon by the other members of the group, who viciously attacked the vulnerable man with a volley of punches and kicks that caused him to collapse to the floor. This didn't stop the horrific attack, and in fear, the 16-year-old boy and the 13-year-old girl fled. His story was corroborated by the youngest member of the group. As interrogations continued, the suspects began to turn on each other and tried to distance themselves from the murder. Nicholas Shelbourne claimed he was not involved in the assault and had gone to assist Sean, attempting to stop the attack and trying to get the 21-year-old to his feet and away from his assailants. When this failed, Shelbourne claimed that he was able to convince Mark Jones to step back and walk away, but as he escorted the 20-year-old away from the field, Jones turned back and ran to continue the attack. Mark, however, had a different story to tell. He originally claimed that he had not gone to the field. He then changed this to state that he was there, but didn't have anything to do with the attack. Just like Shelbourne, he alleged that he attempted to stop the assault. He and Shelbourne were not alone in making this statement. Jordan O'Rourke also denied being complicit, and he too had attempted to distance himself from the attack and appear as though he tried to help Sean. Daryl Jones was the only one who refused to answer any of the questions put to him, and one by one, the other six members of the group started to place the blame solely on him, using his history of violence, claiming he was the instigator of the assault. It wasn't just his friends who incriminated Daryl. His girlfriend and a number of her acquaintances also came forward with information for the police. 
His girlfriend claimed that two days prior to Daryl's arrest, he had sent her a text stating that he may be in trouble for murder. Along with her friends, his partner claimed that Daryl had said that Jordan O'Rourke had been the instigator by hitting Shaw with a bottle, but Daryl had proudly stated that he had finished it. He told them that he had lost control, was caught up in the moment and was unable to stop himself. Investigators now had numerous statements that incriminated Jordan O'Rourke and Daryl Jones in the murder, but another witness placed suspicion on Nicholas, Mark and the 16-year-old girl. On the 3rd of June, just after the group had first been interviewed by the police, Mark Jones, Nicholas Shelbourne and the 16-year-old girl made their way to the local library. As the teenage girl sat alone, the two men were overheard talking. Part of the conversation involved Nicholas, stating, quote, if she doesn't keep her mouth shut, everyone will find out. Other witnesses came forward to advise that they were aware that the group had attempted to cover up their crime by bleaching their trainers, disposing of their clothing, and attempting to get rid of incriminating evidence. It was Sean's Facebook account that provided the police with the final piece of incriminating evidence. They had uncovered conversations between the 13-year-old girl, the 16-year-old girl and Sean. These interactions had taken place over a period of time. Investigators now believe that it was these messages that had led to Sean leaving the house that night, under the naive belief that he was meeting someone who was a friend. The group had a different take on why Sean had agreed to meet the 13-year-old girl. They claimed that he was allegedly going to pay her £100 to perform a sex act on him. When he arrived, the group claimed they attacked him for being a paedophile. This claim, however, could not be verified in any interactions that Sean had with the girl. It was apparent to the police that the 21-year-old, who had issues with forming relationships and understanding other people's intentions, had viewed it as just a friendship. Police believed that the group had targeted Sean under the impression that he had money, and they had originally planned to meet the 21-year-old outside a post office, where there was an ATM machine, from which they planned to get Sean to withdraw cash. However, when they saw there were CCTV cameras, they changed their plans and arranged to meet on the field instead. Unbeknownst to the group, Sean's vulnerable and naive nature meant that his father controlled his finances, meaning that his son had no access to his own money and was given an allowance of just £10 a day. The trial for the seven individuals was started at Nottingham Crown Court on the 3rd of October 2010. During proceedings, the jury were told how the group had lured Sean, a vulnerable 21-year-old with Asperger's syndrome, out of his home in the middle of the night with the intention of getting money from him. When he met with the 13-year-old, he was then set upon by Daryl Jones, Nicholas Shelbourne, George O'Rourke and Mark Jackson. In an attempt to throw police off the cause of Sean's injuries, Daryl Jones removed Sean's shoes and threw them into the road to make it appear as though the victim had been involved in a hit and run. Sean was then left face down and unconscious on the ground, his arm blocking his airways. The court heard how the group had then concocted a story to create an alibi, which was unravelled by the evidence and the witness statements that had been collected. The trial lasted for over two months, and on the 17th of December, the jury returned their verdicts. 26-year-old Nicholas Shelburne and 20-year-old Mark Jackson were found guilty of murder and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. They were each handed life sentences with a minimum term of 13 years. 17-year-old Daryl Jones and Jordan O'Rourke were also found guilty of murder and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. They were both ordered to serve a minimum of 11 years of a youth detention order. The 16-year-old girl who had used her phone to call the ambulance but had also used it to lure Sean to his death was found guilty of manslaughter and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. She was given a five-year youth detention order. The 13-year-old girl who had used her friendship with Sean to lure him out of the safety of his home was found guilty of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. She was handed a two-year rehabilitation order, followed by two years of court supervision in which she would have a curfew between 9pm and 7am and was banned from going into Lincoln City Centre. The 16-year-old boy who broke from the group to tell the police the true order of events was found not guilty on all counts. 
The attack was not considered to have been a hate crime. Despite Sean's condition, there was no suggestion that the group were aware of his disability. In summing up, the judge, Mrs Justice Cox, stated that it was, quote, a wholly unprovoked, brutal and chilling attack on a defenceless young man. Addressing the emotionless Jones, Jackson, Shelburne and O'Rourke, Mrs Justice Cox stated, quote, all acted together in a joint enterprise, the purpose of which was to give Sean a good beating. Each of you intended to cause him really serious injuries. Sean's mother, Sharon, reflected on the group's behaviour, quote, I think they worked really hard to persuade him and lure him out. He was completely harassed, I think. He had been bullied so much, he just gave in. The lead investigator, Detective Superintendent Mark Hosty, added, quote, This was a vicious and unprovoked attack by a group of young people on a vulnerable man who was lured to his death. The verdicts demonstrate that those responsible tried in vain to cover up what they had done in an attempt to escape justice. Their lies and deceit made the task of investigating and prosecuting those responsible for Sean Rossington's death more difficult. The jury have had to consider a significant amount of evidence in reaching their verdict. Our thoughts at this time are with Sean Rossington's family. Following the trial, Sean's older brother, Chris, addressed the press, stating, quote, Our family has been totally devastated by what these people did to Sean. They are beneath contempt. They deserve to go to prison for a very long time. What they did was disgusting, and the way they tried to lie and deceive the police afterwards just shows the type of people they are. Throughout the trial, a number of things were said or implied about Sean that are totally unfounded and extremely upsetting for our family. It is important for us that Sean is remembered as the man he was. A loving, gentle and generous man who cared deeply for his family and his partner and who had so much to look forward to in life. He was a gentle giant. He really was. He wouldn't have done anything to anyone. Thank you for joining me for episode 37 of It's Murder Up North. Episode 38 will be available next week. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows. 